right, testing, testing. Looks like we're ready to go. Um, let's get let's get ourselves started here. Um, let's get cranked up and going. Visualizing numerical data by way of scatter plots. Scatter plots are super funky. And a matter of fact, this this mic is probably far too loud here. Let's see if we can tweak this and make it not so bad. Okay, uh, I don't want to be doing any clipping here. Scatter plots. So scatter plots are super awesome. They can show us two variables at once. And that might not seem much, but some of us are nerdy enough to think that that's super cool. So let's look at this basic principle, which you haven't seen enough of yet. You'll probably see it 12 more times before these lectures are done. The nature of the data determines its treatment. So you can't mix and match certain types of data and graphs and things like this. So it, when we have two separate numerical variables and we want to represent them together, we can do that as long as the data were collected in a certain way. The data had to be collected from the same individuals and those individuals have to each have provided uh, two pieces of information. So each individual provides two values here variable A, variable B, whatever you want to call them, two variables. The variables can be totally different kinds of variables, that's okay, as long as one variable per, or sorry, two variables per individuals. One group of people, two groups of variables. And then you can plot those two things together. We'll talk more about this toward the end of the semester, well, in the middle of the semester when we have to do this for some analyses. You've seen scatter plots a lot, so let's look at these scatter plots. You start with one variable at a time, and you plot it on a number line. Basically, you're making a dot plot. This is a one-dimensional representation of a data set. So abstract, we're just calling this X. And so let's say these are some student scores on an exam. Let's say for each student, you also ask them what their GPA was. Now, the little blue line is the mean of X, not really important right now. So you also asked people what their GPA was. And in this case, uh, we'll call that Y. We'll call the GPA Y there. We'll call it GPA in a minute, though. And so you've got the same number of dots in each group. That's helpful. One group of people, two pieces of information. And so to plot these together, you turn one of those axes perpendicular to the other, and you make the Cartesian coordinate system. And then for each number, each number on one variable, you pair it with the number on the other variable. So this individual has a uh, 3.6 or something GPA, and they got like an 85 on this exam, whatever it was. So we put a dot where those two things intersect. Now, we don't usually draw the two lines intersecting. That's just for your visual reference. Another individual got below a 2.2, or maybe about a 2.2 GPA, and that person happened to have gotten about a 25 percent on the exam and so there are dots down there. Now you're not making this up, you're looking at the data you actually collected and then you're plotting that on a chart or more likely letting a computer do it for you. So this person got a low GPA and a low test score, so did this person. So every time there are two pieces of data that belong to the same person, you can plot them in one place in a two-dimensional space. And one dimension, so the left-right dimension, shows you their x value and then the up down dimension shows you their y value it's pretty clever we probably have Rene Descartes to thank for this or at least so I have read um, not quite sure about the history of these things um, anyway what do they tell us they tell us about relationships between two numerical variables which is pretty killer uh, they also show us the patterns in the individual variables but we have other plots for that and what we really need is to learn about relationships between between variables, between numerical variables. So here we have the relationship shown between miles per gallon of, of a group of cars and the price of cars. So quick question you might get asked from time to time, maybe on an exam or a quiz. How many individuals are or cases are in this data set? The answer to that is you count the dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Each dot is one individual or one case. Here's another scatter plot. Actually, let's look at this again. This is not a straight line relationship. This is a curved relationship. So cars with low price tend to have high mileage. And as the price goes up, the average mileage doesn't change much until you get to about here. 
How about the 19,000 price point now? Maybe that's dropping. On the other hand, that's kind of the average of this other stuff. It really drops when you go past 20,000. Now, I guess people are, have more money to pay for a car. They also have more money to pay for gas, is what the manufacturers are thinking. I don't know. It's kind of a thought. There's kind of a curve going like this. So that's an interesting relationship. Here's the relationship between right-wing authoritarian attitudes and religious fundamentalist attitudes in one of my studies. And it's broken down in two colors by um, the red are not treatment professionals. Those are undergraduate students. And the green are treatment professionals. And so maybe I should do two separate scatter plots because those two distributions seem to be doing different things, even though there's a generally positive relationship. Fairly strong one, actually. Here are many, many counties, as we've seen in some previous um, examples from the open intro data sets. Many, many counties and their federal spending per capita. Uh, ignoring the lines and the dashes and the dots, this is just an example from open intro for how to do scatter plots. As the poverty rate goes up, this is poorer and poorer counties. There's not very many super poor counties, but in general, the more poor your county is, the more money you're getting from the federal government. But that tapers off with the poverty. So there's kind of a positive relationship there. Increased poverty is increased money. But who's getting the most money from the federal government? Are, so federal spending per capita, who's getting the most spending per capita? It's not the poor countries the, or counties. Those counties should be up here if there was a nice relationship. Rather, some fairly not poor counties are getting the lion's share of money so this chart could be titled Pork Politics. Here's fuel efficiency by horsepower. Those same cars as before, but a different variable. And a curve, but a different curve. So the weaker cars, the cars with these little painfully weak engines, 50 horsepower. This is like a 6, 55 horsepower engine. I don't even know what that is. Uh, maybe that's a motorcycle pretending to be a car or something. Um, these these engines are, are very highly fuel efficient and very quickly as you increase the power the fuel efficiency drops and then kind of levels out when you get up to a couple hundred horsepower you don't lose much more by going to 300 and whatever horsepower i don't even know what that is is this real data who can tell this is real data this is um a few hundred students who were surveyed about how far they travel to their jobs if you add all their jobs together these are of those students who work and their GPAs. So the GPAs that are the highest here, the students who have a 4.0, 3.5, most of those tend to be down here, not traveling very far for a job. So maybe they don't have jobs, or maybe their work studies on campus, or TAs for professors or something. That's good for your GPA in general. Um, in general, there seems to be a hit to your GPA if you're traveling 100 miles a week to your jobs, like you're constantly commuting from one job to another. That's not so great. But it's a messy relationship. It's a negative association, but it's not a really strong negative association. This is much stronger. This is those same students' ACT reading scores compared to their ACT English scores. Very strong relationship. Now, the line is, th is not part of the scatter plot. It's thrown in to help us visualize how much of a straight line relationship there is in this scatter plot. And you can also see that this particular computer function puts box plots for the individual variables. So this is the reading score box plot, and that's the English score box plot. They're interesting. So it gives you some extra information there. Now let's do this business right here. Let's, uh, let's look at, these, at this scatter plot here. This is this amazing guy. He's a demographer. He's on um, YouTube. He uses this term Gapminder. That's like his project. Um, and he, he studies demographics of nations and individuals. And he's kind of a rock star of this world for the past five or ten years because he's been doing this amazing stuff, writing this amazing software. So I'm going to scroll this all back here. And what we're going to see is income per person and how that predicts life expectancy. Usually if you've got something here, it's thought to be the predictor and here it's being predicted. Now this is correlational data, so we don't really know, uh, but there's a suspicion that income leads to life expectancy rather than the other way around. So you're going to see that these nations all move to the upper right in general, showing that basically people are getting wealthier. wealthier. Um, the, the circles get bigger too. The, 
there's a lot of information packed in here in very clever ways. So as I'm mousing over these things, you can see information about each of these nations. The United States is this cute little yellow spot right here, in case you're interested. Um, Cuba, France, Jamaica. I think the colors are telling you about which part of the world things are in. So North America and um, the Americas are in yellow. So Canada's here. United States is here. Right next to the United States is Germany. Interesting. India is the big blue circle. Uh, China is the big red circle. So we've got everybody getting wealthier, but then there's a pattern. As people get wealthier, their life expectancy goes up too. So let's play, and we can watch over time what happens. So we're starting with 1800, going through the 1820s and 30s. Things are jumping around kind of crazily here. And you can see China's not really doing much, neither is India. They're kind of hovering down there in that lower corner with low income and low life expectancy, while the United States, Canada, and a lot of the European nations are just getting increased money and increased life expectancy, just climbing and climbing and climbing. And everything goes all crazy at the end of World War II. And then look what China's doing. Now China's climbing up in life expectancy, even though there's not much more money. But now the money is coming in. And India was doing something similar. So you can get tons of information out of certain kinds of charts if you know what you're doing with these charts. And in this case, this guy is just kind of amazing. So I'm going to stop there. I didn't necessarily need to go into all this, but it was just so much fun. And we'll be looking at some more numerical data analysis type stuff next time.